Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier, and thank you for stopping by. I went back to my opening quote for Sub-Saharan Africa as the choice of that moment as the greatest riddle of history. Let it remain a riddle, and you can think about that. Algeria's leader defies protest to seek fifth and last term. Fresh calls for protests and strikes rippled through Algeria on Monday with some warning that President Abdelaziz Bouteflika's determination to run for a fifth term would set the nation ablaze even as he vowed to stand down within a year. This is a farce and a mockery, he said, adding that seeking a fifth term will ignite the country. Leaders within Le Pouvoir, a loosely defined ruling coalition including the military, appear unable to agree on a replacement. Some have described Bouteflika's proposal as a peaceful way out of the political crisis. It also helps to buy time for a regime struggling to find its way forward. This will ensure a soft exit out of this crisis, said Mohamed Kisari. And going back to that Kapuczynski quote, here's another one. If the crowd disperses, goes home, does not reassemble, we say the revolution is over. And uh, according to Algeria Up, um, 1st of March 2019 was probably the largest protest in Algeria's history. In that same article from the 21st of January about the crowd going home, I also described Bashir as a political Harry Houdini, otherwise he would not have lasted more than three decades, but it's clear these are the last days or the end times, I said. I like this cartoon from I Gado, Baliva al-Bashir, and it's rather clever. It now transpires that Zimbabwe's central bank has borrowed $985 million from African banks, its governor said, including Mozambique's central bank. Where they got that money from, it'll be a mystery. And the Afrexim bank. The Afrexim bank is on the hook for a great deal of money in Zimbabwe. Um, Man Goodyear said the loans would be repaid from future gold earnings and had a tenure of between three and five years. He also said government borrowing from the central bank has reached $2.99 billion in December, about three times its permissible overdraft limit. Um, I said that the mind game, game that ZANU-PF had played on its citizens has evaporated in a puff of smoke. Mozambique wants to void $622 million of Credit Suisse loan. This is the tuna bond saga. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Of course, we've got Manuel Chang in prison in South Africa. We've got Guebeza's son un under arrest. And we've got plenty of drama going on. The bonds, by the way, uh, are trading at about 86 uh, cents on the, it's 86 and 89 cents on the dollar, the low since November. South African all share, that's up 6.6% here to date. Dollar versus Rand, take a look at this chart, 14.2135. Nigerian all shares up 2.23% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange is down 1.81% year to date. The 6th of August last year, I was writing about the Indian Ocean and what I described as a port race. And I said, everybody in the hall, everybody's jostling for optimal geo-economic positioning in the Horn of Africa. And uh, uh, Kobo 3 has written a great article in the East African, Fasten Your Seatbelts, the East African Century is Already Upon Us. Let me uh, um, give you a few comments from this rather lengthy and very, very good article. He's interviewing Mr. Joshua Oigara, the CEO of KCB, and he says to uh, Kobo, if it does a few right things, Uganda can feed China, he said. Let's think about that. Uh, Joshua also said uh, institutions like KCB work regionally, give credibility to the East African project, but money, says Oigara, is the easy bit. It is not the magic bullet 
the magic bullet is logistics and infrastructure. You can have a free market, yes, but it will come to nothing if you can't move goods and services at all or at speeds and costs that are competitive. The median age in the East African community is 18, Uganda is lowest at 15. On the other hand, the median age of Southern Africa is 25.7. That's an interesting nuance in the demographic dividend story. Eastern Africa is also one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Today, Eastern Africa is a consumer market of 457 million people. This will grow to 587 million by 2030 and 800 million consumers by 2050. The global population growth will be driven by a population explosion in East Africa. We shall still be having four babies per family for most of this century. Then the world's top most populous nations, Nigeria will rank third with 793 million, this must be 2100. DR Congo, fifth, 379 million. Tanzania, eighth, 303 million. Ethiopia, ninth, 250 million. Uganda, tenth, 213 million. Kenya, 142 million. So while by 2100 the world will be African, home to more than one in three people, Africa itself will largely be East African. Then he says, the northern half of the Indian Ocean, flanked westwards by Asia and eastwards by Africa, will have the world's largest economies and most of its population. The Indian Ocean, which already accounts for half of the world's container traffic, will be by far the most decisive trading waterway in the world. Um, Indian Ocean Grand Zone needs an organizing principle. China's answer for an organizing principle is the One Belt, One Road initiative. Race is not just for military bases. There is another track where nations are competing to be the regional and in general African logistics hub. For now, Djibouti has a leg up. In the EAC, Kenya and Tanzania continue to bulk up their Mombasa and Dar ports. The most ambitious initiative is the Bagamoyo port, with the $10 billion undertaking partly funded by the Sultanate of Oman's Sovereign Wealth Fund and China's Exim Bank. Tanzania is also working on the Masambwini port and railway corridor to be built from Tanga. This means that between 2025 and 2040, the East African coastline will be littered with the most military, foreign military bases in the world, but also possibly the busiest chain of ports outside China. Um, then he's talking about the east side, majority of fastest growing economies being found there. By 2030, we shall see the myriad economic groupings collapsing into probably two. Consider what is happening in Ethiopia's border with Kenya. Abiy himself and Aromo has pursued a sometimes controversial pacification of the Aromo, who have long opposed the regime in Addis and brought it to its knees in early 2018. The Aromo regional state covers nearly all of Ethiopia's border with Kenya. He's saying in the past one year, Kenya has reaped a boom from its Ethiopia-facing investments of the past decade. Construction of the Mombasa Nairobi Addis Ababa Road has brought Mombasa back into play. Big is a key port for Ethiopia. Very interesting article worth watching. Here's a short clip that I put up about this Nairobi Addis Ababa Road corridor and the amount of boost that the AFDB was expecting. With respect to the issue of age, I, I wrote about this in 2014 when I was talking about Wagadugu's signal to Sub Saharan Africa. This is this demographic dividend or demographic time bomb. I said then what's clear is that a very young, very informed and very connected African youth demographic, which many characterize as a demographic dividend, but for beautiful blaze turned into a demographic terminator, is set to alter the existing equilibrium between the rulers and the subjects and a rebalancing has begun. We need to ask ourselves how many people can an incumbent shoot stone cold dead in such a situation, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand? I think that question still remains relevant given what we've seen in a number of different places, Khartoum, Harare, DR Congo. 
uh, where that threshold lies will be discovered in the throes of the event. Therefore, the preeminent point to note is that protests in Burkina Faso achieved escape velocity. Overthrowing incumbents is all about acceleration, momentum and speed, best characterized by the German word blitzkrieg. But, you know, this is the point, this dividend, is, it's binary. Andrew Corribico, or who I follow, and on the point about the Indian Ocean, says the Indian Ocean region is expected to become the geostrategic center of gravity in the new Cold War. I couldn't agree more with him. 6th of August 2018, I was speaking about an, the Indian Ocean economy in a port race, and I said today from Massawa, Eritrea, admittedly on the Red Sea, to Djibouti, from Berbera, to Mogadishu, from Lamu, to Mombasa, to Tanga, to Bagamoyo, to Dar es Salaam, through Bera, Maputo, all the way to Durban, and all points in between, we're witnessing a port race of sorts, as everyone seeks to get a piece of the Indian Ocean port action. China, the BRI initiative, which Kobo sees as the organizing principle, the Gulf countries who now appear to see the Horn of Africa as their hinterland, Japan and India to a lesser degree, are all jostling for optimal geo-economic geo positioning. August 2013, I wrote about how I have no doubt that the Indian Ocean is set to regain its glory days. I wrote in September 2015 on the occasion of a visit to Tanga, that Tanga, the first point to note about it, is that it is geostrategic. This is a photograph of Tanga from the air. May 2016, I wrote an article about the geopolitics of pipelines in East Africa and why um, the president, uh, uh, Magafuli, winning that pipeline to Tanga was a big deal. This caught my attention. Nordvint Airlines flew from Moscow, Vunukovo, to Caracas, Simon Bolivar on February the 28th. On March 1st, the same Boeing 777 flew from Caracas, Venezuela, to Entebbe, Uganda, continued to Zanzibar, Abed Amani Karume, then returned to Caracas for four hours and now is on its way back to Entebbe. Well, that's an interesting uh, situation. This is an interesting report by McKinsey with USAID estimating the economic value of conservation in Kenya. It's terribly underestimated. Over the weekend, I wrote about the shilling. I said the shilling crossed the psychologically important 100 mark last week. We underestimate, I said, the regional safe haven status of the currency. And I've noticed that these downside moves in the Tanzanian shilling are being mirrored by the strengthening of the Kenyan shilling. The government of Kenya appears to be inclining towards heavier issuance in the Kenya shilling with a tax-free infrastructure bond slated for sale. If this is the thinking, then I expect the shilling to strengthen further as Kenya taps offshore funds. The charts signal a move as far as 92. But I would have thought that's too bold and the central bank would slow that down. We are, we're at 100 right now. Nairobi All Shares up 9.44% year to date. NSE 20 is up 2.78% year to date. Safaricom is up 19.144%, closed at uh, 26.45. Market cap $10.592 billion. Price earnings ratio 19.167. All the brokerages who send me emails have been upshifting their M PESA forward earnings curve after the launch of Fulisa, this overdraft facility. Um, and it's this which is lifting the share price. This I found interesting. The average repayment is in 2.8 days. So people are really using this as an overdraft facility to help them complete the transaction when they don't have enough cash in their wallets. KCB, we were talking about Joshua, Joshua's comments, closing price 41.45, market cap $1.27 billion, trailing price earnings ratio 6.446. Thank you for stopping by.